Richard Hammer. Is that good? Okay, welcome everyone to the Oxford Preparatory Academy regular meeting of the Board of Directors, July 27th, 2017. 5.30 p.m., a closed session, 7 o'clock p.m., open session, meeting location, Oxford Preparatory Academy, Saddleback Valley Campus, 2282 Lamont Drive, Lake Forest, California, 92630. We have one teleconference location tonight, Oxford Preparatory <coughs> Academy, South Orange County Campus, 23000 via Santa Maria, Mission Viejo, California, 92691. Uh, the public, including public attending a bet call conference location, are invited to address the board regarding items listed on the agenda. Comments on an agenda item will be accepted during consideration of that item or prior to consideration of the item in the case of a closed session item. Please turn in comment cards to the board secretary prior to the item you wish to speak on. Call to order, roll call. Deborah Tarver is absent. Naveen Adley? Here. Albert Diaz? Here. Sandra Garner here. I need a motion to uh, approve the agenda for regular board meeting for July 27, 2017. I'll make a motion. Second? Second. And moved and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 We're all in the same location tonight. Very good. <laughs> okay. All three of us. Yeah, it's all three of us. Uh, public announcement of reason for closed session. Uh, Closed session items are for discussion of possible action. Conference on legal counsel anticipated legal provision. Uh, Government code section 549569B4, that's one matter. Conference with legal counsel anticipated litigation. Government code section 549569D2. Be nice if I have in this said settle the litigation, wouldn't it be? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, <laughs> conference with legal counsel existing litigation, Government Code Section 549569D1, Oxford Preparatory Academy versus Chino Valley Unified School District, Oxford Preparatory Academy versus Enlightened Learning Solutions, and Public Employee Appointment Government Code Section 54957, Title Chancellor Saddleback and Valley. Time that we are going into closed session is 534. There's absolutely no comments, are there? Okay. There are no you comments, have to, but you have to ask. Okay. <laughs> uh, Jennifer, are there any comments? Not tonight. Thank you so much. Okay, so now we're going to close session at 535. Thank you. Okay, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We're returning to open session at um, 706. I know that's a surprise. Uh, I would caught you off by surprise, didn't I? But that means we have to go back into closed session at the end of the meeting, but we certainly want to keep this on time. We have a one report out. Uh, the board did approve final agreements related to Charter Schools Association's appellate funding of RFPO. So now the language is complete and it is actually signed the agreement. Um, the other thing that I want to, uh, to talk about uh, before we go into uh, communications is this. And maybe I'll make this part of my, my statements under communications. Um, I know there's always a lot of questions between the schools uh, we, about, about uh, segregating money right, between the campuses. So one school is not responsible for somebody else's expenses. And I just want to let you know that the board and administration, uh, we're very much in tune to this. We're very committed to making sure that the money stays separate as well as the obligations stay, stay separate. So we're making very we're taking a lot of time to make sure that as we close down Chino, that all of the expenses that Chino should be paying for, that we're, uh, that we're um, um, making sure that we have um, identified the monies. Uh, we actually have to report out uh, what the expenses are, what the closing expenses are. So for example, when it comes to something like, uh, uh, like um, any of our court uh, situations uh, in litigation that involves Chino alone, that's a Chino cost. And we will make sure that we take care of those expenses before we close the books on Chino. Does that make sense to everybody? Mm -hmm. uh, when our attorneys are dealing with something that impacts all three schools, like maybe writing a policy, uh, then it's, it's appropriated based on ADA, okay? How many students each school has. So I, I just want to assure everyone I want to make sure everyone understands that every campus <coughs> takes care of its own expenses. 
and that the other schools will not be held responsible for anything that was Chino's expenses when we finally do the final closure. Okay? So that was something, you know, that I just want to make sure everybody could be understood. I know that everybody's heart is aching for Chino. I understand that. And we had a parent meeting last night. We talked about that. We shared with them the phone calls that we had received from Orange County parents and families, and they were so appreciative, so we want to send back to you how, how appreciative they were of all those kind of words and, and prayers that you've been sending up for them. Uh, but, uh, but we're going to have, we need to move on now, okay? And it doesn't mean we've totally given up hope. Uh, we're champions. We all fight to the bitter end, and, and so that's what we're continuing to do. And of course, the appeal also goes forward. Okay, appeal has not ended. Okay, so other comments? Um, the media, any comments? Um, just a couple things. Okay. Um, it is a disappointment. Um, the news that we got earlier this week, but we do still have hope that in the middle, we will have a good turnout. Um, so there is still hope there. Um, just to re reiterate what Sandra stated regarding financials. So I, I do go through a review with Charter Impact every month as we close. Um, I will not sign off on anything that I believe is going to be a common of up any funds. Um, I will not put my name to that. I just won't, and they know that. Um, so I want you all to know that. Um, so if I feel like there was something that was going to be misstated or stated in a, a P&L that is incorrect, I will call it out. So, guys, thank you. Robert? That's exactly what you want. You know, it's it's tough. It's uh, tough that we've uh, we were that the writ was, or at least that the temporary restraining order was lifted, and that we have to fight it without Chino being open. Um, but we'll, we continue to pursue every option uh, for all our families. Every fight that we do, I've I've said that um, any weapon that is effectively used against Chino can be used against any of our students. And so, um, and every lesson that we learn, and everything that is brought to our attention does, uh, and everything that we shore up just is, a, is not just a, a shore up for Chino, but it's a shore up for the organization as a whole and benefits all our schools. And so, um, we've got uh, the next renewals coming up, and so we're going to be focusing on that as well. Do you have any comments? <coughs> uh, just a, a few quick updates. Um, we are working on uh, moving out all the items from the Chino Valley campus. Uh, we have until August 7th, so it will be a time crunch to remove uh, the items and materials. So we, we are uh, currently, uh, not currently at this moment, uh, but today we did uh, two truckloads of 52-foot uh, truck, um, and then Monday is when we'll kind of attack it again, get everything off the Geo campus by August 7. In terms of staffing at uh, SLC and Saddleback, here at Saddleback we're completely uh, fully staffed, uh, which is great uh, going into the school year. Uh, SLC, we still have two positions, uh, but those will, be, those will be filled shortly. Uh, the team uh, led by Mr. Pasco has done a great job at planning professional development uh, for the, for the uh, next two weeks. Uh, we start on August 1st, so it's great to have uh, two campuses kind of coming together unified uh, to, to create plans. And we're excited that at SOC the science lab has been delivered. Uh, so they're working on that. So very excited that uh, we're moving forward in that direction. Um, a, a big win for here at Saddleback. Um, we had a PCSGP review, uh, public charter schools uh, grant program. Uh, we received funding from them a few years ago. We had to have a report, so a third party had to come out and be on the campus. Uh, staff, teachers, parents, students were interviewed. They went through all of our files, our financials, our governance, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they gave us back the report. Uh, it was a, a glowing <coughs> report. And one point I wanted to share was that, uh, I quote, our team was quite impressed. Uh, and in many areas, you are well beyond what we typically see in a new school. So congratulations to the, the Saddleback team. Uh, and finally, we have unofficial task scores in uh, for our schools. Uh, excited about the progress that SOC made and excited about the um, baseline that Saddleback did for this year. So as soon as we can share those out, we'll shout the official scores again. Thanks. Thank you.
do we have any comments from the audience on items not on the agenda? We do, we have three. Okay, so we will be given, uh, the public including public attending a teleconference location are invited to address the board regarding items not listed on the agenda. No individual presentation shall be for more than three minutes. Jennifer will time you. And the total time for this purpose shall not exceed a total of 15 minutes. We'll be well underneath that. Uh, ordinarily, board members will not respond to presentations and no action can be taken. However, the board may give direction to staff following a presentation. Please turn your comment card into the board secretary prior to this agenda item. Angela Williams. Hi, I'll be Hi. really quick. Um, I don't know if this works or not. I don't know if I need it. Um, I'm obviously... You just covered up the microphone. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Please start me over. <laughs> okay, out yeah, of you. Um, I, I'm here, I'm really heartbroken about Chino. That stay was a gift, and the fact that we couldn't broker a deal is beyond devastating. With that, we can't do anything about it. It's heartbreaking to me. A few things. I'd like to see a breakdown of the fees. Chino was billed 130, SOC 75, SV 48. I'd like a breakdown of what those are for. I think that would help in the transparency and to communicate with the families. Um, because it looks like in that report, Saddleback and SOC are absorbing a good portion of the fees, and I don't know about that. Um, and who's going to be paying for the current appeal that resulted in the closure of Chino? If it's the California Charter Association, how much are they going to pay? What's the percentage? And do we have a contract? Because I'd like to see a contract in writing from them and what the percentage is and how much it's going to be and what the cap is for us. I think all of that needs to be communicated. And then, Sandra, you made a comment at the beginning about, you know, we will all share in the fees if it's for a policy. Well, since we're the test case for the California Charter Association with Chino, would, would the SOC and SB be absorbing those fees to help make law, which would benefit all charters? Is that something we have to I was to talking about board policy. I understand. That's why I want a clarification. Because I want to make sure that that doesn't happen. I just want to be clear on it. And when you talk about the obligations going with Chino, what's the current status of Turner Augusty and where does that leave us with that loan? I'd like to know. I think that it would help with the transparency and the money issues that we have if everybody just put it all out there. If you have to be like a check registry, you know, whatever it needs to be every time so that everybody feels as confident. Hearing Naveen say that, I feel confident in the fact that she's going to give that information and do that, but, but seeing is believing. I need you to show me, not tell me. And from what I see, I'm not getting a lot of it. I'm just getting a lot of talking, but I need to see it. And I think that that would ease people a little bit with the transparency issue that a lot of people feel. So I'd like to see those things, and I'll follow up with you on it. Yes, Najami. Hi, um, I'm an interested parent, and I just got voted in for the parent advisory board, and um, I've just been waiting, I'm waiting to see when we're going to meet because we really want. There's been so much turmoil recently, and I know the parents at SOC and the parents at SP and all of us. We just want to be part of this community and make sure everything start going smoothly so that there isn't any worry because you know our renewal is coming up soon and I know a lot of parents are worried and I just want to have it I want to know when the meeting's going to be so that I can start telling people if you can calm down don't worry everything's taken care of and also just to be more informed as to what is going on because we really I mean it's, it's hard wrenching what has happened I feel that a lot of it happened because a lot of parents didn't know what was going on and we really don't want that for either school. We don't want, we just want, I don't know, just, we're just heartbroken. We just want some kind of answers. So this is the when we're going to have our first meeting. I'm sorry, which meeting was this? I'll carry the advisory. Oh, okay, got it. Thank you. The NAS meeting. <laughs> and at the South Orange County campus, Pam Thompson. Good evening. I just want to um, tack on what Ms. Nas said. Uh, my name is Kim Thompson. Um, let's see, I have been involved with OPA. I'm a community member. I live a couple streets down from our school. I My son went here for two years. He was also part of the Scholar Academy. I was interviewed for the WASC accreditation. 
I was on the uh, on study board. I ran the student store. I now work as her as an aide here. I ran a major's class. I feel like I have a little bit of uh, what has been kind of going on in the school in the last um, couple of years, and that's why I too ran for the advisory board. And we have heard nothing. And my son says I've talked to a couple of the other parents and trying to find out what's going on because I'm looking there and there's uh, three of you there and. Um, Andrew, Mr. Crow, sorry. And we want to be part of this story. Uh, we want to be involved in it, and there hasn't been any movement. And I think of what we can do. I mean, I've only been involved in the school for three years, and I think of how much I've actually done. Nas, Angela, Erica Cox, Erica Cameron are also parents. Um, I'm a classified staff. We have so much to give back. And we'll just feel like we're sitting and waiting. So it would be great if we could at least find out what the advisory board is even about. I've heard rumors that we're going to be giving stuff and talked about that. And then I thought, well, wait a minute. We're supposed to be coming from a different standpoint of I'm classified. You know, when I'm in the class, I think that's where all the magic happens. And I think that this advisory council really should be based on, you know, in addition to what goes on the outside, really what happens inside the classroom. So um, thank you for your time, all your time that you guys do. I can't imagine um, how the Chino families feel um, today. And I appreciate the fact that you are going forward with, with this appeal because we want the same thing for the other campuses that happen. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Okay, moving on to the uh, consent agenda. We're going to table the revised employee handbook. Uh, and I'm going to pull the updated parent handbook <laughs> for SOC and SB campuses. Uh, but we have all the, all the minutes, the warrant report for April 2017, and the 2017-2018 master calendars for South Orange County, Saddleback Valley campuses. Does any board member want any others to pull for discussion? Yeah, can I have uh, a motion to approve the uh, consent agenda? I'll make a motion. And the second? I know the one of you were first and Andrew was second. Yeah. So yeah. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, okay. So on the um, the reason why I pulled um, the um, updated parent handbooks when we were here last uh, toward the end of the school year, we had some parents that were concerned about a comment that had been made about. Um, School Spirit Mondays, believing that those were going to go away or they were going to be greatly reduced. Uh, and so I just wanted to read from that part of the handbook to, to tell you what's in the handbook. And it does say every Monday, uh, our champions in grades one through eight attend an assembly where students have pom-poms, sing our school spirit songs, and hear announcements for the week. Uh, so every Monday, okay, so it's actually in uh, our parent handbook. I did have one question though, Mr. Crow, if you can answer it for me. I did notice between last year's and this year's that this a sentence, in addition, the Oxford prep vision of patriotism will be um, promoted. So why did we take that sentence out? Was that an accident or should it have been there? Uh, th yeah, that should still be in the, oh, okay. in the, in the handbook. Okay, yeah, so it wasn't there. So, yeah. so we will approve this with that being in there, right? Because yeah. we still have our spirit songs, we still have our patriotic songs. Right. We still, yeah, we still have patriotic songs at certain levels. But that will be also on the Monday, yeah, because I know they get their little book right. They got, they know all their songs for the year. Mm -hmm. right? Okay. So as I see, we always have a, like a traditional song and then a patriotic song. Okay, so that's a good case. And then, uh, then it depends on what they're doing that month, right? Like you have the monster mash, I guess, in October. Mm -hmm. we do. Yeah. Okay. okay. Just wanted to make sure. So, um, do I have a motion to approve both handbooks? Okay, do I have a second? I'll second it. Okay, all those in favor of uh, approving the current handbooks, please say aye. 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 Okay. Presentations. Saddleback Valley Campus update. Uh, Tammy Lopov and Ms. Boucher. Yes. Okay, take it away, ladies. All right. Welcome to SB. Thank you. Um, Welcome everybody. It's really nice to have everybody out here. I want to start with our condolences and everything that's transpired at Chino over the last few days. 
I um, personally have been there the last few days for a little bit of time, sharing time with some of the employee stuff and, uh, pardon me, as I took the opportunity today to just stand and look out over that vast campus. There is a piece of each of us, I understand, that is now going away, hopefully temporary, but it is difficult. And from being with this organization from the very beginning, it was, it's been a difficult time. So our condolences go to um, all of the Chino staff and anyone affiliated with this organization who could possibly be feeling this loss. Our appreciation for all of the hard work in the attempt to make sure that um, we were able to move forward. We appreciate that as well. Um, just a couple updates uh, about how uh, Saddleback Valley has been going. Um, I did want to say a big thank you to our Honor Society. At the end of last year, they um, approved the purchase of new science lab tables and stools. So those have arrived. They're being put together. Our science lab is looking awesome. We have brand new high top block tables with the stools. So it actually looks like a science lab. So we're very excited about that. Um, other things happening on campus, you know, our custodians have been working extremely hard, getting the campus ready, cooling. Uh, we did, you know, vac uh, the carpets just got done being cleaned. Um, like Mr. Crow said, we got fully staffed, so we are very excited about that. Um, and other than that, it's kind of just business as usual, kind of getting ready for um, that second year, trying to have it, you know, start with, without a hitch. And we welcome those Chino employees, Mr. Scheib. <laughs> yes, we're very excited about that. <laughs> and then uh, several others that are going to be joining the staff. Very well. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you, guys. We have um, a financial update for June 2017 by Charter Impact. Are they coming in over? I'm here. Hi. We're, we're, hold on, we're, hold on just a second. We don't have your picture yet. I, we definitely want to see. Can we not get a picture? Or all audio? There you are. Okay. Okay, sir, you are on. Andrew told, Andrew told me I look good. But okay. <laughs> I'm good. So I tried to turn something off because. Uh, Wrong thing. You, you've muted yourself, Andy. <laughs> okay, I'm just going to have to uh, have a. Um, okay, so uh, I'm happy to speak to um, any of the questions earlier. Um, first of all, let me just overview tell you that the financials that we provided for June are still preliminary. This is fairly normal um, at year end. Um, we're, uh, there's a lot more work involved in closing year end and making sure we've covered every, got everything covered and totally uh, accrued properly. Um, and with the board meeting here, um, we wanted to get, provide something late last week that could be included in your package. Um, so um, we uh, put something together. We are still making some, or we made some conservative accruals to, to ensure that we've covered everything and that we don't have any negative surprises. Um, but we are still getting invoices in and revenue details from various agencies to make sure that everything covered uh, and carefully uh, done at the end so that the audit is as clean as possible. Um, the more we get into the close, uh, before we actually finally close, the less we have to have audit adjustments when we have the audit. Um, so we are holding June open for a little while, which is again normal for your year end. Um, let me go to the, I don't know if you're what page you're on, but the second um, page of the package that I sent, which is the uh, financial summary and um, visual form. Uh, verbal form, there it is, next page, there it is. Um, it, I know it's a little hard for people to see, but I'll walk you through it. Um, all, overall, all three schools are uh, financially healthy, um, as I've said uh, for the last few months, with uh, significant reserves and cash and no significant areas of concern. Um, the June year-end financial performance at each school is slightly less positive than forecast in the last report. Um, we as part of our work have discovered that um, a number of employees, especially the teachers, um, were on 12-month um, uh, 
contracts and we have only been accounting for 11 months of those so we include an extra month of payroll for a number of employees um per gap requirements employee contracts that extend beyond june 30th are, uh, are required to be accrued into the current year and when they were earned um the performance for the year at each school i'll just summarize uh um, again, and these are preliminary, but at least and I'll talk about them as if they're done, but, they're, but we still have some work to do. Um, all three schools finished the year with positive surpluses and favorable to budget. Um, Gino ended with an annual surplus of 1.1 million, um, which was 333,000 better than planned. SOC ended with a surplus of 424,000, which was just slightly better than planned, but still a very significant surplus. Um, so positive, uh, where revenues exceeded expenses. Um, Saddleback ended with a surplus of a little over $1 million, um, which was 400000 better than planned. Um, those positive surpluses add to the fund balance, um, and that fund balance uh, at this point preliminarily is uh, Chino $2.5 million, and SOC $1.9 million, and Saddleback a little over $1.1 million. Um, all healthy uh, surpluses and all healthy fund balances um, that everyone should be proud of. Um, the, uh, the cash at each school, um, at the end of the year, uh, Chino, and this is less preliminary since cash is actually what's in the bank, um, Chino uh, was at just slightly under a million with an accounts receivable which meaning what's still owed from various uh, state and federal agencies for revenues of 944,000. Um, SOC ended with a cash balance of 1.68 million. Um, and by the way, an AR balance of $450,000. I'll show that on the balance sheet when I show that in a second. Um, and Saddleback uh, ended the year with $1.4 million in cash um, and an AR balance of uh, 685,000. So um, I can walk through a bunch of details on each of these uh, financials. I, I, I joined uh, just after you started um, the open session. So I obviously people have looked at some of the details and in, in, in some of these financials and happy to ask, answer questions for the board or we can go um, or skip to the balance sheet, which is uh, a little more detailed. Really quick, where would we see restricted versus unrestricted funds? Um, you, you don't normally, uh, we don't normally provide that level of detail. The, the um, very little of what of the funds that you get are restricted. Um, there's the special ed uh, funding that's restricted. That's, there's um, funds related to PG, uh, PCSGP, um, which is the startup grant. Uh, the only school that's receiving that is um, of, um, is uh, Saddleback Valley this year. Um, and the, the, I would say the better part of 95% plus is uh, unrestricted funds. Um, and and uh, sometimes, uh, the, for example, I mentioned at the last board meeting, the uh, education protection account, which is this required um, it is a is a form of restricted um, funding that says that you just have to show that you spend some money, um, enough money, which is very very limited, less than two percent of the funding you get, um, but that you spend less than two percent of, you spend more than ninety eight percent of your funds on administrative costs. So you have to pro prove that you spend only two percent on non administrative costs, which is virtually actually is pretty impossible since all the teachers are non administrative. Um, but very little is, is um, unrestricted. We, we would provide that information as part of our uh, reporting to the uh, county. Did you um, mean and, uh, the, 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 the different the, the columns between restricted and unrestricted, we have to report as part of the, 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 um, the first interim report that goes to the uh, district and the county, the second interim report that goes to the district and the county, and a report that's called the unaudited um, another actual report that we are required to report to the county 
uh, around the 1st of September. I don't, every school is different, so I can't remember the exact date, but usually it's the 1st of September, um, which is a, um, which shows that the, the amounts in each of the columns of unrestricted versus restricted for every school for the 16, 17 years. So we have enough, we have we work for that, although it's not hard to do. Um, I will be presenting that at probably the next meeting, if not the one after that, where I, where the board will approve um, the preliminary, the unaudited actuals before we send them to the uh, to the county. Um, but uh, I guess you can rest assured that the amounts are are very small for uh, a school like um, like the three we have, because very little of the funding you get is restricted. Thank you. Okay, let's go ahead and go to the balance sheets, Andy. Sure, the balance sheet is on the almost, I think the second to last page of this report. Um, again, I'm happy to go through anything in detail. I don't want to skip over everything. Um, obviously, people have a chance to look at it. Um, but I did want to at least point that out. Um, there it is right there, a little bit higher. Yeah. Oh. By the way, 21? Yeah, 21. Page 20, 27 on my report. That one. Because the word word assets is that there it is right there. No, oh, just past it. Just past it. Excuse me. That's it. Thank you. Yeah. Right there. Okay, so this just uh, this is the balance sheet um, and shows the net the, the, the a picture of the financial position of the organization at any one time. This is as of June thirtieth. Um, is the balance sheet. An income statement is a picture of over time, and a balance sheet is a picture on a on a particular day and. This is as of June 30th. So as of June 30th, uh, you can see the numbers I mentioned. Oxford had a cash balance of 994,000, and an account, an amount due uh, that's still due and owed from various agencies of 944,000. Um, the next line is that what's called due to from, which is the um, what's due from the other schools in this case, which is $312,000. Um, the way we to ease the uh, administration of uh, such a complex organization, we typically, we oftentimes run a number of things, especially payroll, through one organization, and then we allocate, uh, per Sandra's comments earlier, we allocate the exact cost of each school to, to the school. Um, and at, the, at any one time, we may not be completely caught up on all those things because there's so many pieces going in and out, um, but there were some pieces that weren't caught up. Um, that amount fluctuates all year long, but we clear it out. We try to clear it out at the end of each period. Um, and uh, then um, if you look down and towards the bottom, there's accounts uh, payable, uh, various accrued expenses, including things that might be, would be owed, like rent or legal expenses or um, various, or loans that are still outstanding from the um, California Department of Education. And then right towards the bottom is the total net assets, which is the net worth of the organization, the assets minus liabilities, and in this case, Kino has a balance of two point, almost two point six million dollars. Um, similarly, the other two schools, um, you can see without me walking through them, and the organization as a whole, has, at two thirty, have had cash of four dollars and receivables still owed of two million dollars, and a total net worth or total fund balance or net assets of five point six million dollars. So we're over that. So a healthy, this is a healthy picture for um, a charter school organization and uh, organization should be proud of these financials. Thank you, Andy. Sure. Andy, just a quick question uh, regarding the uh, receivables. Uh, do we have timelines on when we expect them? Yes, we do most, a lot of them come in in July. However, um, if you give me a moment, I can pull, maybe you don't want to wait that long, but we do track as part of our balance sheet reconciliation when, when these are due. I would say, without pulling that up quickly, um, I would usually the, there's about 75 or 80% of them that are due just in July. And in fact, I'd be surprised if um, all of the LCFF, uh, which is the bulk of this, hasn't already been received. Um, oftentimes, special ed revenues or lottery revenues or um, uh, education protection account revenues or um, 
federal, uh, the, for example, the PC, uh, the charter school startup program for Saddleback Valley. Many of those come in in the September, October timeframe. The PC SGP revenues typically take at least three months from the time that we report those revenues, which we, we submitted a report, uh, um, I think, in, uh, er, in early July. But um, we, so we will, and that's on, saddle, that's on Saddleback. We won't see that until probably October, in my guess. But that's a, that's only about fifty thousand dollars. I, I most of this comes in, in in July or late July. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions, Mr. Crow? Okay. Thank you, Andy. We're good. Sure. Drive safe. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not driving, but I'm going to stay on for a little while. I think there's a couple of other conversations. Okay. Um, qualified candidate committee, board member, qualified candidate committee. Um, Kameen, did you move on? Right. Albert? Okay. Mr. Diaz. Okay. So, um, we received applications from 14 candidates. All were parents of SOC and Saddleback Valley students. <laughs> of those 14 candidates, we narrowed down the list to seven and attempted to schedule three separate meetings. We had one of the seven drop off and one that was unable to attend any of the, any of the available dates. So eventually we conducted six interviews, three at SOC, and, I'm sorry, five interviews, three at SOC and two at Saddleback Valley on two separate evenings. Um, assisting with the interviews at the SOC location was Mrs. Pascal and Mr. Crow, and assisting with the interviews at the Saddleback Valley location was Mr. Crow. Um, let me begin by saying that it was uh, it was truly enjoyable to interact with all the various parents, uh, and listening to their points of view, their stories of how their kids got in, um, of how the schools got started, and various campuses, and their experiences um, uh, in everything, how we've experienced it and how each uh, of the communities have experienced it. And uh, as well as getting equally grilled by, by them asking us questions. So that was, uh, that was, that was a lot of fun. Um, all five candidates were more than qualified and each of them would bring a unique perspective to the board. In the end, uh, Mrs. Adley and I, with full agreement from Mr. Crow, uh, selected three candidates to present to the current board for evaluation and for the nomination of the two seats. Uh, those candidates in the order that they were interviewed are uh, Mr. Raymond Jackson, Mr. Joseph Haney, and Mr. Ashwin Arbor. So we, are, we actually invited um, all the gentlemen to be us to so that we could all hear from them. Uh, and so you have a particular order. I'm, I'm happy to do it in the same order that okay. we, uh, we okay. interviewed them. That's good. <laughs> well, he was this animated director. Yeah. <laughs> First of all, uh, I want to thank you for doing all that you do. Uh, I can't think of an organization that is in as much flux as this one is. And uh, to, to sign up for what you guys sign up for is, is a big deal. And uh, you definitely went through a, a lot of very difficult a lot of stressful times, and for that, I say thank you. Um, I'm not shy about hard work. Uh, I'm an OPA advocate, so during my interview, I think I shared with you the story of my children who uh, we had it uh, for four years. Uh, we sent them to Montessori, three children. And you can imagine what a commitment that was for the family to make that happen. And they were not thriving. We moved into in the hills so they could go to Valencia. And they were not driving. And we were fortunate enough to get to Oba. And after that first tough year, now they're driving. So I consider any attack on the Oba community something that personally gives my hat a lot. It makes me want to throw my hat in the ring to say that I'm ready to come help in whatever way it is that I can help. Now, I'm an Oba advocate. Whoever the best candidate is, I want them for. There are lots of qualified people. The best person is 
stop me I'm all about that. So when I say that, I'm no bad. But use me in whatever way I can help. Because I want to see Hope thrive. I want to see Hope survive. So I don't, but I want to open up to any questions that you have that you didn't get a chance to ask or something that came up after, perhaps. Are, are you available 24 7? <laughs> Goodness gracious, you guys must work a lot. It's not intended to scare you. <laughs> and they did, actually. That's pretty onerous. Thankfully, I work very close to here and I live very close. And, and I'm super fortunate that my company is largely self sufficient. We've been in that period for three years where I've been trying to make myself irrelevant. And I think I've just about done that. So, so the good news is, is that that would leave me surprisingly available. But again, I'm available during the day because my office is only about six or eight minutes from here. So, so I'm a little bit flexible with my schedule. Not 24 hours a day. <laughs> Like, like that said, we, we've had, I think, like 27 meetings over seven months, so extremely unusual yeah. for any board. Yeah. Uh, however, we're working very hard, right, Mr. Crow, to go to one meeting a month. <laughs> but we have to be ready because we never know what's coming our way. Touche. Touche. But that's what I want to leave you with. But I was going to say, that was one of the questions I asked a pre candidate. I'm like, okay, are you, because I'm not dead. I signed up for more than parts and I ended up with more than I signed up yes. for. Uh, so uh, that was that was truly one of the questions we asked. And can you share with us what expertise you feel that you would bring to the board? Well, I, uh, I mean, at the risk of going on and on about it, I'm a licensed general contractor, high voltage electrical, low voltage electrical, licensed alarm company operator, licensed locksmith, uh, classically educated MBA, Pepperdine, Leadership and Managing Organizational Change is my uh, emphasis. So got a lot of design, build, construction, contracting kind of experience, so that would be in some way beneficial. Um, as part of my Pepperdine experience, for those of you that know, is we're, just, they take that you know, principle of the debate thing very seriously. And so in groups like this, I tend to thrive, not because I pick people who like the same things I like or want to pick the same things I pick, but I'm a big fan of principal dissent. And so if you've got a divergent opinion, I'm excited about hearing about that because that's what's going to keep us from making the wrong choice, is by seeking out people who uh, are going to challenge my thoughts on a variety of things. So. Okay. Okay. If you think of something else, call me 23 hours a day. <laughs> 23. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Nate, Mr. Joseph Haney. 23 hours? <laughs> you can negotiate the 22 and a half. I got to talk to my wife. I can't commit to 23. The threshold's 15. I think more than that, I got to bring it home. Um, I'm here because we, my wife has a friend and we've watched the experience that she had with her children at the SOC campus. And we watched her children cry, and we watched them grow, and we watched it jealous because we didn't have it in Saddleback. And then we did. And we were enormously blessed with the opportunity to get to attend this school. And then this horrible thing happened in the fall and we started hearing about them about what would happen in Chino. And it was gut-wrenching because you worry, did that happen to our school? Did that happen to our campus? And then when what happened in June happened, you watch and you have this horrible heartache thinking, I can't imagine spending my last month with the school here wondering if we're going to have a campus, if we're not going to have a campus, the teachers wondering if they're going to have a job, if they're going to have a campus. And it comes down to this notion, as I was talking to my wife, that instability is destabilizing. And this board was put into this ridiculously difficult position of having to steady a very steady ship on tumultuous waters. So I, I'm here because I don't want another school to have this to go through what they did in June. And I didn't walk on that campus. I don't even know anyone there except the people that I met through my interviews on the board. But I, the end of the school year is an amazing time. I remember as a kid, it's joyous, it's exciting, it's celebrating your achievements, it's worrying about what you're going to do next year. It's teachers looking forward to some time off. And I I just can't imagine having to look at my kids in the eye and say, you know what we've done for the last few years? It's been remarkable. We unfortunately are having to do something else. 
And so I'm here because I see you guys up there fighting to keep that wheel and that ship steady and keep it afloat. If I can throw a hand in and help somewhere on 23 hours a day, <laughs> I would be honored to do so. And then answer whatever questions you have. Can you also uh, speak to the specific skills, the expertise that you put in this? Certainly. Um, I'm an attorney. Uh, I'm a real estate and tax attorney. My practice is here in Orange County. Um, so I understand that those issues have come up on the board, but I think what's more important is what they call the soft skills of that job. Um, communications, uh, analysis, problem solving, strategic thinking. Um, a lot of times people call and they have a problem that's really not a legal problem. It's, they just need to help focus and come up with an understanding of how they approach the solution, or approach the problem, come up with the solution that works. That's a big part of my job. That's at least eight hours per day. Um, I guess at least it was 16. Um, so I have that background. And I, I don't, I, people I've ever worked with that I've tried to model myself after, I've watched them unfold that skill, <coughs> those set of skills, and make organizations better. And so I think that I can bring that to this point. <coughs> Had I known I was going to be on TV, I should have told my kids because I wanted to be here. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I have some fair remarks, and my son would kill me if I didn't read these because he helped me write them. <laughs> so um, just my name is Ashton Agarwal. I have two children on the SOC campus, um, a son that's going into seventh and a daughter that's going into third. Um, we've been there now for five years um, since the second year the school was open. Um, and my wife's actively involved in the campus. And candidly, I, I wasn't too involved. I was just busy working for the first three or four years. Um, I got a little bit more involved last year. Now I'm now uh, a consultant on my own, so I've got some more time at home. Um, and I've always believed if you want to have change, you've got to put yourself in that, in that position and get a seat at the table. So that's why I'm applying for the board. Um, just a quick bit about myself professionally. Um, I have not been involved in education. I worked in corporate America for 20 years. Um, worked in um, corporate finance, have an MBA from USC. Um, worked for some, some of the largest companies in Orange County, dealing with Wall Street, Davis, et cetera. Um, Sandra, you asked about specific experience. Um, I, I think there's some that can directly benefit of uh, some of that's dealing with internal controls, accounting, finance. Um, I do budgeting right now, forecasting, managing multi million dollar budgets. Um, ability to operate in high stress environments and a very personal legal environment as well. Um, I will bring a different perspective to the board. I'm not afraid to challenge. Um, I'm going to question a lot. That's just that's just my nature, but in a respectful way. Um, outside of work, I'm actively involved in the community. I'm a, I'm a soccer coach, and I also serve on the House State Political Board for the Mass State Political Council and Finance Program. Um, my wife and I, we've made great friendships at Oak, but we've been on vacation with families that we've met there. My, my, both my children love it, and I, I, want, I want the school to be around for years to come, not only for my daughter to make it through eighth grade, but also for the future champions as they come through, and, and that's, why, that's why I'm here. Um, and lastly, you know, as the other gentleman did, I wanted to, to thank you. I didn't realize how much of a time commitment this was until I heard you, to be quite honest with you. Um, you guys have sacrificed a lot in a tough time, right? It hasn't been easy in high-stress environments, and I think that's admirable. Not, there's not a lot of people that would sign up for that, so thank you so much. Tell your, tell your son you did very well. <laughs> <laughs> and it'll be available on video. That's right, I get a little scholarship. Are they blue on all the other little blue? Yeah. 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 I know you answered my question. Anyone else? Okay, thank Great. you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. We brought three good candidates. You did very well. Uh, we have, uh, according to our bylaws, we have a two-meeting process. So the first meeting is to, to nominate, to introduce them to us, and then at the next meeting we will actually vote uh, for uh, the two candidates that will fill the two expansion seats. Okay? So before uh, we get to September, <coughs> Okay, so thank you very much for coming out, and thank you to everyone who threw their hat into the ring. Uh, any kind of public service is uh, is God's work, and so anybody who's willing to uh, to get involved and do this for our children, um, I really commend all of you. Uh, and it would be
be willing to make this kind of commitment because it does take a lot of time, obviously. So thank you. So even if you weren't selected to be here tonight as one of the final candidates, thank you to everyone uh, who did apply. Okay, we're going to move to items for information. The first uh, item up is for the governance uh, committee update. Uh, the governance committee currently consists of myself and Mr. Diaz. And uh, as part of our responsibilities, uh, we brought to the board the concept and the blueprint for an advisory council for each campus. And so I just wanted to share with you where we are in that process. Uh, right now, we're putting together the orientation meeting that will take place. Uh, the chancellor will be there. They're not voting member, but they're an advisor uh, to the committee. Uh, and then uh, Mr. Diaz and myself and Mr. Crow will all be there. Uh, and we're putting together what that orientation will consist of. We're waiting for obviously everybody to get back from vacation because we don't want to do different orientation meetings, right? So uh, we hope to have uh, that meeting and once school starts. That means we know everybody's back, at least they should be. And we'll have the orientation meeting, and so we'll give you really good ideas to what is, what your role is as an advisory council member. I would imagine that it's also probably going to uh, include uh, some other items, just backfill you with information about the school that you may not already know. Uh, and so you should be hearing from us, I would say, in the next couple of weeks uh, as we set the date. Uh, I would like to, uh, uh, we haven't decided if we're going to bring both campuses together or go to each individual campus. I think it depends on time because I don't want to delay too long to get into another school. So we will figure that out. But I think we've gone out with the announcements as to who's on the advisory council and we congratulate all of you. I'm uh, very excited about this. Our previous advisory council was more like a marketing uh, board, uh, which isn't what we're looking for. We're really looking for an advisory council who can truly advise and, and bring us the concerns of obviously their school. So um, I, I thought that when I looked at this, the um, parent handbook, or do we have a tie for one of the positions or are they all filled? Um, we have a few staff positions that are available here and the alumnus position is still available, but that was at Chino where we had the Okay, so we still have something to fill? We still have staff member positions. Okay, to got fill. it. Okay, so what is our plan with the after Once school? school starts. Okay, good. Okay, excellent. So we are going to have an alumnus on each one of the councils, and then the uh, ASB president, right, will also be a member. Okay, so I think it's really excellent, all of the, uh, the different stakeholders that are going to be represented. Question? Yeah, I'm sorry. So what, only because of the students on that, it's going to be after school, not during the day. So oh, exactly. No, no it's got to be a time that everybody okay. can participate. So each council is going to have to work out what that looks like. Uh, but however, I think the president would like to get out of class. <laughs> <laughs> and the only thing that we're going to, that you're kind of hold up on, is the orientation. After that, when you meet, how often you meet, what you talk about, what you bring back to the board, you guys are, you won't be asking us, you'll be updating us. So you guys won't be at that meeting, we're no. just going to, it's the initial one that Exactly, exactly. Okay. And, and what we did, uh, and for anybody who wasn't a part of this, when we did create the, the advisory council. We, uh, all campuses were involved, and all parents, all stakeholders were invited. And we came up with a blueprint uh, for you, for your bylaws, but now you have to take it and you have to run with it. Right? So we did a lot of the initial work for you so that you could actually hit the ground running pretty quickly. Uh, but after that, that's going to be up to you. Okay. We will also be adding um, a section on our agendas so that at each board meeting, we would want an update from each one of the advisory councils. So we can also stay updated on what's happening with you. right? And then you will also be able to advise us on, on, on some agenda items. Okay. So we'll go over all this at orientation. So instead of being limited to three minutes, and this is then your timer goes off. No, you are just like uh, the board members get to speak, and just like the uh, well, well, maybe not you, <laughs> but at, at um, you know major stakeholders at, uh, at regular district board meetings, as, as a, use that as the example, they're not they're not. I'm sorry, but your time is up. They don't get that. They present to the board, and they're on the agenda. Okay, excellent. Finance committee update, maybe. Um, I do not have anything to update. I just um, 
I just want to address Michelle, what you stated it earlier. Um, to the extent that we can, we will, I mean, the books are open, right? These financials are public. I know you want more details. Yeah. Um, and I, I think there are things that are within the um, realm of litigation that we may not be able to open, but for whatever details we can that are on here, we will definitely proceed to share. So, I mean, I'll defer to Sandra if she wants to work with Google and, and identify what those things are. If you email her the list that you addressed earlier, um, we can definitely provide that. I mean, there's, yeah. there's nothing that we're hiding. I don't think, I just for the they, sensitivity they, of Right, they just, when it's not explained and we've had such financial issues, it really makes it difficult. That's fair. Right? Yes. And we want to say we're transparent and I'm not saying we're not, but we don't look like it based on that. And it doesn't show all the debts. When I'm looking at it, I can't see what the debts are. So when they're saying we have all this money, I'm like, okay, well, in my mind, if I use Common Core, if I use one plus one, this doesn't add up. And so that's difficult for me yes. when I'm trying to look at it. Yes. So please address your question. Okay, I'll be emailing okay. <laughs> Uh, employee insurance update, Mr. Poe. Uh, is excited to announce our coordinator for resources. Okay. 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 okay, so I put together. You guys are all new to kind of going through this process with in regards to our employee benefit plan. Um, so I thought I'd put together instead of just giving you with the specific details, it's kind of a brief overview of. Um, what we provide our employees. Um, and so, our sort of preparatory academy, we understand that staff members aren't just employees. Um, they're parents, sons, daughters, um, golfers, gardeners, coaches. We appreciate the whole individual, not just the employee. Um, so, we care about their well being. Um, so, we are committed to providing a comprehensive benefit program that meets employee health care um, and financial needs. We do that by maintaining quality options for um, employees and their dependents, uh, maintaining benefit plans that are cost effective and market competitive, um, and minimizing double digit increases for our employees. Um, year to year, as you may know, uh, health benefits, they typically increase. Um, and there's typically a significant increase each plan year. Um, so we do our best to minimize those significant increases for our employees while still offering a very well-rounded comprehensive plan and different options for our employees. So in order for our employees to be eligible for benefits, they have to be a regular full-time employee working more than 30 hours per week. Um, they are able to enroll eligible dependents, which is a legally married spouse or domestic partner, and either a child or children up to 26 years of age. Um, any mid-year changes that take place would have to experience a qualifying event, such as marriage, uh, separation, uh, birth of a child, etc. And then our enrollment period. Um, our plan year is September 1st through uh, August 31st, and so we go through our open enrollment period in August, and that's when we present new plan year information to all of our eligible employees, uh, and then they have the opportunity to either continue with the plan that they've been previously enrolled in, they can make changes at that time, uh, if they want to change their carriers or their medical insurance, they can do that, uh, if they want to cancel coverage for vision insurance, they can do that. Um, it's a great opportunity for them to kind of get a refresh on the benefit plan options available, as well as for new employees to get all of the information like you guys are getting today. Um, any mid-year new hires, they have 30 days to enroll in benefit coverage. So the different insurance plans we offer are uh, HMO and PPO options through Anthem Blue Cross. Uh, HMO option through Kaiser Permanente, uh, Principal Financial Group uh, for Point of Service Dental, dental Insurance, excuse me, as well as um, Vision Insurance through Principal Financial Group. Um, under Anthem Blue Cross, uh, that whole package does offer our employees um, an employee assistance program uh, where they can call for um, counseling, those type of items. Um, and then 
all employees um, under Oxford Preparatory Academy, uh, whether they choose to enroll in benefit coverage or not, um, are uh, eligible to receive uh, group term life insurance, which is 100% um, paid by Oxford Preparatory Academy. Yeah, yeah. And then um, they also have an additional group term life option for um, additional life insurance benefits um, through Principal Financial Group that is 100% employee paid. So moving on into um, the different information for plan year renewals, um, our third party administrator, we work with um, Health Savings Associates, um, they're working with me to get all the information in place for the open enrollment period. Um, and so in comparing what we currently offer our employees, um, there was a significant increase in um, what monthly premiums would be. Um, so if we continue with our current plan under medical for Anthems, Blue Cross, HMO, PPO, as well as Kaiser, uh, HMO, there was a 10 to 15 percent increase in monthly premium monthly premiums for employees um, and so that's really really high um, health savings associates being the great people that they are that i work with they offered us an alternate option to look at um, and so the next page on your handout um, goes over the alternate option for anthem and then further down goes over kaiser um, the level of the comprehensive plan itself is still very well-rounded and very competitive with what charter schools offer um, as, and even better than what local districts offer as well as even businesses. Um, we, they did make some tweaks in regards to copay amounts, um, out-of-pocket maximums for employees, um, but that kept the cost overall for monthly premiums low. Um, those percentages were about a 5-6% increase. Um, so after consideration with Mr. Crow and reviewing all of the options available to employees, while we were and have always provided top model Cadillac insurance coverage for our employees, we are still providing that top model Cadillac insurance for our employees. However, we're not going with the sport model, we're going with the entry level top model Cadillac. Um, so it's still a very well-rounded plan, uh, but we chose to go with the alternate option um, in order to better suit our repertory economy as a whole, as well as to look out for our employees. Um, towards the end of the uh, packet, I did a cost analysis um, that shows the current benefit um, plans um, that we have this last year, continuing for next year, as well as um, the next page, what it would be if we went to the alternate option. And most of the employees that enroll in employee spouse coverage, typically for medical, do the same for vision and dental coverage. So I did just kind of a generic calculation. Um, and you'll see if we continue with the plan that we have currently, if employees have that generic coverage all the way across, they've got about a 100 to almost 300% or not percent dollar increase in the deductions that they see from their paycheck. Um, and so in order to avoid that, we chose the alternate option um, so that way employees see less of an increase in their monthly deductions from paychecks if they experience one. Um, we thought it would be better suited for our employees um, to give them these continue, continue the well-rounded comprehensive plan um, just instead of when you go to the doctor and you say, pay $20 okay, you pay $25. Much does each employee get a month? 
confirm that Oxford Preparatory Academy um, has a $916 allowance per month for their employees. That's based on a 12 month calculation. Um, so it's $11,000 annually for our employees. Um, so typically, if an employee is enrolling in coverage, medical, Anthem, Kaiser, HMO, PPO, vision, and dental, it's typically at no cost to them. Um, even some of the plans, if they enroll in coverage for themselves and a child uh, or children as a dependent um, across the board, depending on the plan, it could be a zero out of pocket cost as well. Um, so it really just depends on the plan that we enroll in. Um, we have some that enroll in employee children coverage for medical and then employee only for vision and dental, employee family vision dental. Um, so they just kind of play around, especially those that have spouses that receive insurance coverage from their employer. They kind of play to see where they save the most money in regards to their um, insurance money. Um, so it varies, but we do have a lot of employees that are currently enrolled, um, most of which um, enroll with Anthem Blue Cross coverage. Um, but we do have a large chunk of employees that are also enrolled with Anthem. So, we thought the alternate option would be the better option for our employees in order for them to save an out-of-pocket cost that they would see in their paycheck. The employer portion went up a lot significantly. The employer portion, that's been consistent. Um, yeah, I saw, I saw that at the budget. It went up a lot. Thank you so much. If you have other questions, feel free to let me know. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, moving on to the items for discussion and action. Uh, first, we have a, a suicide prevention policy to approve the California Education Code, uh, Section 215, as added by Assembly Bill 2246, uh, mandates that the governing board of any local educational agency that serves pupils in grades 7 to 12 inclusive adopt a policy on pupil suicide prevention, intervention, and post prevention. The policy shall specifically address the needs of high risk uh, groups, including suicide awareness and prevention, training for teachers, and ensure that a school employee acts within the authorization and scope of the employee's credential or license. Can I get a motion to approve the policy? Do I have a second? I'll make a second. Mr. Brown. Uh, this is not something that we will talk about. Uh, but it's, uh, a great job by the, the state to require any schools that have seven and eight graders to adopt a suicide prevention policy. Just acknowledging that we know that uh, there are youth who commit suicide, have suicidal ideation, uh, and are affected by it. Uh, for us, this is to create a safe and nurturing campus that minimizes that suicidal ideation, uh, provide an appropriate and timely response. Uh, if and when that, that would happen with our students. Uh, if you flip to page two, you will see that we have, uh, we have the San Bernardino County information in there still, but we have the, the resources uh, for the policy. You see that the primary suicide prevention point of contact is Kristen Crow, a counselor, uh, and at each campus, um, it will be amended that um, uh, Dr. Sarah Tana will be at Saddleback, so that the school psychologist will be the, the secondary point of contact for this, uh, this policy. Uh, on page three, you'll see the layout of the actual prevention policy. Um, we want to focus on prevention. We want to, to, to be in that realm. But we do have intervention assessment uh, and referral for students who uh, do fall into suicidal ideations uh, and even potential suicide attempt. Uh, so we've walked through this policy with, again, uh, school counselors, school psychologists. Uh, this is modeled on the, the new state policy. This is new for everybody. Every single uh, organization is going to have one of these. We're going to continue to refine it to, to get better, but it's a really great job that they did uh, in terms of prevention and then what happens afterwards. If you look on page four, one of the components of training, uh, at least annually, all staff shall receive training on the risk factors and warning signs of suicide, suicide prevention, intervention, referral, and post -mention. It's a very touchy uh, subject. Uh, we already provided a mandated report of training, which we'll talk about later. This should just be an addition to it of uh, what to look for. Um, it will come from trained professionals who have the license and credentials to do the training, both in-house 
uh, and our house. And if you just look through the pages, um, you'll see that there are a number of um, resources that we use and that we'll continue to use. Another thing I want to, to highlight um, is on page nine. That uh, um, the first full, the second full paragraph that Oxford Preparatory Academy will support the creation and implementation of programs and our activities on campus that raise awareness about mental wellness and suicide prevention. Uh, for example, mental health awareness weeks, peer counseling programs, and national alliance on mental illness on campus clubs. It's going to be a super sensitive topic, uh, and we will be very careful with how we roll this out. Very excited to bring in the advisory councils uh, to, to help with that. Um, but we want to make sure that we are giving the supports needed to the children who are affected by this. While understanding that we do have, you know, five, six, seven girls on campus that, you know, uh, we have to be careful about how they're exposed to any of these talks. So uh, this will be a work in progress. Uh, but we'll be excited to to actually you know, implement the peer mentoring, uh, which is very important to implement small groups um, and to really be targeted once someone uh, has identified as having these suicidal ideations. What's required by law uh, as far as what age would you last be required to start this? Seven days. Seven days. Yeah, okay. seven days. Yeah. Uh, and then if you will just flip over one more page to 10. So you'll see uh, on other staff, two Oxford Preparatory Academy staff members who have received advanced training in suicide intervention shall be designated as a primary and secondary suicide intervention liaison. Uh, that is Mrs. Crow, a school counselor, and a school psychologist who have received you know, training well above what any of us have received to, to support us. Um, they'll be the first point of contact for any administrators when, when things happen. Um, uh, this puts into place what we're already doing. These issues are already on our campuses. Uh, we're already dealing with them. This, this just memorializes um, what we do after we, we hear about this thing and causes us to do much more prevention. So this is the, the YouTube suicide prevention policy, and um, it really just focuses on we will be doing training with our staff members, uh, and then at some point we will start rolling out programs to the kids. Um, but that will be after a very thoughtful discussion on what the best practice is. So, uh, thank you for the board and this policy. And this kind of gets wrapped up into that whole uh, mentor reporter where. Basically, it's, it's not it's something that every year, like clockwork, we're trashing and making sure that everyone receives the right training. Yes, sir. Is, is it still relevant to the Pacino, I mean, now San Bernardino contact? Um, you know, it, potentially, we talked about even including, um, if Chino was not there, including uh, LA County, because we might have people who live in Orange County or in San Diego County or, or, um, or, or LA County. Uh, but it probably could be safe to, to strike the San Bernardino County for now. But that would require us uh, to come back if we do have a school there eventually and then add in. I think it's just easier to maybe leave it there. An extra line item with an extra phone yeah. number can't hurt. Fine. And I think you'll also have some students probably attending here yeah. that will be San Bernardino County students as well. So. Okay, any other questions? This was depressing. Uh, all those in favor of approving uh, the suicide prevention policy, please say aye. Aye. Uh, opposed? Yes. Approved under bidding policy, the Board of Directors is committed to safeguarding the school's funds, continuing the process of tightening, I, I read lightning, uh, tightening internal controls and increasing transparency with the school's authorizers and stakeholders. This policy is part of the fiscal policy and procedures, sets forth guidelines and procedures for acquiring bids or estimates on certain contracts. Um, before, uh, Carrie, you can make this statement. Can I ask a quick question before then we'll get a motion on the table? Uh, this is part of a very big policy, fiscal, right? And while I was reading it, I thought, I think there's some things we probably need to go back and revisit, okay. you know? But we're really focused now on, on the vendor's uh, policy. Now, down here in, in E, it says, uh, request for bids or estimates must be published or advertised in a manner determined by the executive director or board of directors. Is it typical to have it determined by the executive uh, director and approved by the board of directors? Uh, from, unfortunately, we have not had a vendor bid, bidding policy before. Okay. So this was, we 
worked very closely with Charter Impact, mm -hmm. and it was run by Legal for Review. Uh -huh. And this was one of the one of the items that they requested that we have in there. So we don't have a history right. to go off per se. Um, I don't know if Mr. Crow can answer that any more thoroughly um, because there hasn't been one in right. the Because I was just but thinking that it would seem appropriate for the executive director to determine it and then approve it to the board for approval. Uh, the only, the only. That's, that's the rank, right? Yeah, the... yeah, it's just that one band, uh -huh. rank band. The only time we've done this, you know, formally uh, was with our National School Lunch Program, RFP. Um, and I, don't believe that was board approved, but you know, as long as they, they, they was in a timely fashion, you know, as long as the board approval doesn't, you know, take a long time, I don't see a problem with board approval. I'm just saying, I thought I read this to be um, the process to be determined by the executive director and then approved by the board. The process, I wasn't thinking that it was each individual bid. Am I reading it wrong? No, I think each individual bid. Oh, okay. Request of bids, it must be, yeah. Okay, yeah. so then it's a time, so then it could be a time issue. So I think it's better that we leave it like that. I think it's always nice to bring it to the board when you can, yep. when yes. you have time, especially if it's something that really. That's why yeah. with that Got cost it. involved, okay. that band of you know above twenty five thousand. Okay, that's why that is there. Got to be brought to the board. Okay, then if we could take a look at I, um, where it says uh, where the board chair or the executive director determined it is not in the best interest of Oxford to solicit bids or estimates. I guess that's again a timing issue because sometimes it's going to be a money issue that it's automatically going to go to certain people. Well, that's in here as well that we don't necessarily have to go with the lowest bidder, uh -huh. um, and we can, in, in the event that there is the only vendor policy, um, then we may need to go with that person. So, right. for example, we tried to get three bids for the school lunch program. Only one person submitted a bid, so we went with that person because it's someone we wanted to get going immediately. Um, and as far as if they don't apply, um, the, like for our, our insurance services, for something that's confidential, that may not be uh, brought for. So okay. does that answer? Yeah, but I guess what I was saying though is that if it was a certain amount, it would have to be approved by uh, the different uh, people that are on these um, signatories at yes. different levels. Yes. So that's, that's yes. taken care of. With the yes. of, of something potentially like an uh, example right now with the, the Chino school closure, an immediate decision kind of had to be made on right. removing items from the campus. Right. So something like that would be the exception. Exactly. Okay. Right. So, so let me get a motion on the floor. Okay. Uh, can I get a motion to approve the vendor bidding policy as part of the fiscal policy and procedure manual? I'll make a motion. Can I get a second? Second. Okay. It's all yours. Thank you. I just wanted to see if we were going to have amendments before we. No, of course. Okay. Um, so as I said, um, this bidding um, policy is to safeguard the school's money and again to promote transparency. Um, so this policy applies when you are purchasing equipment, materials, supplies, or certain services. And that we're going to work to obtain the greatest possible value for the schools. And as you'll see, there's different uh, ways we're going to do that. So for purchase or contracts up to $5,000, um, bids or estimates are not required. However, to your point, Ms. Garner, um, your approval, if it is over that $10,000 limit, will still be in place. For purchases or contracts above $5,000 up to $10,000, at least three bids or estimates are recommended. It may be cured in person, telephone, email letter, or any other method of communication. For purchases or contracts, above amount above ten thousand up to twenty five thousand and they're also subject to paragraph f which we'll go over in a minute at least three written bids or estimates are required and it must be on the vendor's letterhead and that would allow uh, it, it for review for the, both the executive director or the designee in this case mr crow to make an important decision uh, for purchases or contracts above that twenty five thousand we briefly discussed that there must be a competitive bid estimate is required, and it must be published or advertised as we did with the school lunch program in an, uh, it's something like the OSU register or in a manner determined by the executive director or the board. Uh, it must include the required scope of work, instructions, and the deadline and the approximate date when the board will review it, and any other information be relevant to purchase the con uh, or contract. The EV shall attempt to secure at least three written bid estimates before
before they're presented to the board. And then the executive director shall make a recommendation to the board based on the three estimates. Here is that section F that was referred to earlier. In the event a vendor is the only vendor, um, it is permissible for Oxford to solicit and accept one bid as the estimate, as long as the ED or designee shall retain a written explanation of why that vendor is the only vendor. Um, a selection of the, here's part G, selection of a bid or estimate shall be based on multiple factors. So it's not just the lowest price. It's about initial and future costs, the quality of the products or the services, and any warranties, the capability and experience of the vendor, and the time or delivery of the performance. Um, it must also comply with other applicable Oxford policies, such as our nepotism policy. H, the executive director or designee shall maintain a copy of all written bids and estimates, and section I, these procedures for vendor building, bidding and estimates do not apply to certain contracts such as those for professional services and insurance services where the board or the ED determined it's not in the best interest of Oxford to solicit bids for those estimates. And that determination will be made in writing and remain on file for one year. I think it looks great. I'm so pleased to find out. We are. Finally have this in yes. place. Okay. I, I like the fact that we're keeping the bids on file. They're available for a period of time. Exceptions are being made. That uh, an explanation of what they were is in writing. Right. So I like all of that. One thing that I didn't notice when I was reading but to mind and while you were explaining it, um, is something that, that I, I know that uh, Mr. Uh, I brought up before, um, and I don't see it here, I don't know if it has to be here, is um, when the board gets the winning bid, if you will, uh, as presented as here's the one we want to go with, that in the past that we've, we've said we actually want to see all the bids, even the, one, even the ones that didn't win. Right. So we want to have the three bids or more the five bids or whatever it is presented to us will be, okay, well, here's the three, and the, here's the one we're recommending, even if, you know, whether it's the lowest or not. So does that have to be in there, that, that request that we've made? Should it be in there? When, let me just read you this really quick, um, where it says the executive director gets the three bids and will then present the final bid, that's the, the issue that you have, or that's the question you have? That I'd like why to, is that whether happen? we should have, uh, whether it should be included here or not, I'm still, the, the request from the board in the past has been, we want to see those bids too. Okay. Should that be in here? <coughs> I, mean, I don't see why not. I think to make an educated yeah. decision, that makes perfect okay. sense. But I don't see why they wouldn't be shared. Right. But it does say the executive director shall make a recommendation to the board and all bids and estimates that were received. So I would think that would cover, okay. I would but that would cover that. that. That would be implied there. Right. That's the exact statement I was looking for. Um, because it's, again, in order, we want to make the best decision for these schools. And you're taking, you be taking one person's idea of what the best was, and I think that's what has gotten us into an issue in the past, and not having these policies in place to begin with, and now to have a group consensus of what is truly best for these schools is going to be exceptional. It's going to be very important for our success. I have a motion and a second to approve the bid bidding policy as part of the fiscal policy and procedure manual. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries. Update discussion of possible action regarding new insurance policies. Do we have something? Um, information will be provided regarding uh, this information. I guess it's going to go to Mr. Crow now. Yes. We'll leave that motion. Uh, so the team has been working diligently on um, updating our insurance policies. We've got a number of coverages, and we want to make sure that we're eliminating redundancies and ensuring that if one coverage goes to uh, six million, and then we have an umbrella policy that starts at five million. Uh, that's a redundancy in between that five and six million dollar range, uh, and we're also looking to you know cut costs and, and go with the most effective. Um, organization. So what you have in front of you is a proposal for our workers' compensation policy. A little background on charter safe. 
Charter SAFE is a, uh, a joint powers authority, which means that uh, a number of organizations go together, almost a co-op, if you will, and purchase insurance at a much lower rate than, than you can get on your own. The nice thing about Charter SAFE uh, is in the name. I mean, they, they work with charter schools. That's their expertise. They understand the different complexities. The difference is between charter schools and charter schools. So you have in front of you a proposal for workers' compensation and charter state. Unfortunately, at this moment, Charter State uh, is not considering covering us for all of our uh, insurance needs. I want to a short time to get this done. But the nice thing with this is getting our foot in the door with Charter State shows us to be a respected entity uh, who is open and transparent. So this allows us to create a great relationship with them. What you see on page three of seven is the premium that uh, we are looking to pay for our workers' compensation. It's $103,000. Uh, if, you, if you spread that out across 12 months, it'd be $113,000. So we're looking at $113,000 for a year's worth of workers' compensation coverage. You see, previously, uh, our cost was $250,000. Now, it's not that they're cutting in half, because that would be miraculous. You have to understand that our workforce is down by about 45%. So we would expect our workers' comp to go down by roughly 45%. Uh, and as you see, our, our workers comp went down by about 55, uh, maybe 57 percent. So um, we were able to get a, a much better um, offer from Charter State to cover us. So I present this to you. Um, you look at page four. You can see how they made their calculations. Uh, right now, we're slated for 212 employees uh, with an annual payroll of about 7.3 million. So this is updated with everybody's salaries. Uh, this includes uh, positions that aren't filled yet, that are still budgeted for. So we were very concerned with the numbers that we gave them. Uh, I appreciate your flexibility on the timing of this. We are working up until um, that August 1st deadline to ensure that we have everything in place. I'm checking my emails right now to see when other proposals are coming through. I'm very thankful to Janet Kaiser, who has been a consultant for us on this. Uh, and she's not here, but uh, uh, Ms. Candy Reyes uh, has been instrumental uh, in, in pulling information, uh, in pounding Carrie Threat, in pounding Rachel Zarnaki to get them information, to uh, shore everything up. We had to submit proposals with Chino included. Yeah. And then we had to pivot really quickly um, to, to pull that out. So I apologize for not having the other policies here, but we did not want to overpay with having you know, an additional school. So right now, all you have is workers' compensation, and the other policy we'll get to as soon as we can uh, and, and work on uh, in providing you with the um, cost um, analysis. So this is the workers' compensation that I would ask you to do. So what came through from charter saves? Uh, maybe I was just thinking something. I thought it's a workers' comp and liability. Hey, th yeah, that, that's the name of the policy, the yeah. workers' comp, but yeah, not separate one. Yeah. Oh, okay. This, so this is the only one we're being asked to approve yes. tonight. When do our other ones run out, and what is our situation as far as we have any last coverage? Yeah, so uh, we are, two things, uh, our coverage runs out um, July 31st. So this is a, this will be effective as of August 1, this charge shape component. We are looking to get the policies tonight, the rest of the policies, uh, and we've been assured if we either don't get them tonight or we can't get them board approved in any time, they will be back dated to all this month. So that has already been given to you. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, do I have a motion to approve the insurance policy that's just presented? Okay, a second? Second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Motion carries. Okay, I think we've got a table number four. Does that make sense to everybody? That's Boss uh, Pacino Valley. Uh, then we're going to move on to number five, appeal for WASP withholding of accreditation status or reapply for accreditation status for Oxford Prep South Orange County. Uh, June 28, 2017, Oxford Prep received a notification of withholding of accreditation status for Oxford Prep SOC from the Western Association of Schools and Colleges, known as WASP. The board uh, needs to discuss the notification for WASP and consider directing staff to prepare and submit. Um, Either an appeal or a reapply, and or we could do both. Uh, I think that one doesn't exclude the other. Am I correct? correct? So rather than make a motion, why don't we do the presentation? Then we know what we want to do. Okay. Mr. Curry, it doesn't say your name, but I'm. Uh, 
I'll take it, I guess. Um, so you, obviously you know that we have our accreditation school. Uh, the first thing to say, as always, is the accreditation is not needed. Um, it, is, it is a nice validation of what we do here. Uh, we do see validation through the PCSP review. Um, the issues with WASP uh, were not related at all to their visit to our academic program. So the finance they saw when they were here doing it was around a uh, potential um, it's not a material revision, but you might as well just think about it as a material revision that was not reported. So uh, we're confident that <clears throat> should the board choose either either path, uh, that our site visit was fantastic. They had nothing but great things to say to it. Um, the, the, the benefit of the, uh, appealing it is that we can do it immediately and they hear it sooner, but they will be, uh, the drawback of it is they will be considering everything that's happened since they first granted. So we do have a lot of issues there. Um, for the reasons they did for the status would still be would still be relevant. In terms of reapplying, uh, it's a longer time frame. We would have to, you know, again, uh, submit an application, we'll have a site visit, probably during the, the you know, late the 17th school year, they would come out. Uh, you're looking at you know, between uh, 10 and maybe 16 months for if you reapply. Uh, so the drawback is the time frame, but the positive is that we uh, get a fresh thing. That's where we're sitting with the WAS status um, with South Dakota County. And uh, to kind of preempt something, uh, whatever the decision is made, we will also ask about what's the consideration of Saddleback Valley in terms of how long we have to be open. Um, would they be included? Uh, because we'd like to just get uh, this school WAS credit as well. One of the things I've been on to the WAS side, and they have very specific criteria for being even able to get um, a, uh, an appeal through. And I can see any of them that were relevant to us. The one that seemed to be closest was, you know, are basically the facts the facts. Well, at the time that they made the decision, those were the facts. There were things that they felt like they were missing. Uh, and there were things that we still had in progress. So I, I'm really wondering if the appeal is really the way to go. Uh, you know, I just, you know, I, there, there's just a criteria. And, um, say that uh, I know of no time that appeal has been successful. Right. Doesn't mean there hasn't been any, but in my research, I haven't found any successful appeals of the decision. There is no appellate court to take it to. There is no judicial review. It goes back to the same entity yeah. that made the first decision. So when they, um, if we do appeal, they have to No, it's not a de novo review. It's literally they will go back and, and they're they're going to review their decision. So we're going to appeal. We're going to appeal their um, their June decision that where, where they where they took it away. They're not going to go back and look at you know the, all the, the paperwork they went through. They're going to well, what, we, what we've done since then. And do we know how long appeal goes? Uh, you know, no, we I do know that they only have um, three three meetings a year. They only have three meetings a year. So they just held one. So you're looking at by the time we even get up to be considered, um, you know, that would be in, you know roughly four months, and then another decision probably you know at the, at the spring meeting. So we're looking at spring of 2017. Uh, questions, but I have an opinion. Um, my feeling is that we should wait. We should step back. We should. Let some time pass from uh, the formation of the opinion that they had that caused them to reject us, if you will, or, or, or deny us and, and remove the accreditation. Um, to kind of take a uh, give that time where now we can come back and say, look, please, we'd like you to evaluate this new organization, this new uh, fiscal and management financial policies and everything in place to be able to present everything that we've done to separate us from the big man. Because uh, that was most likely a, a really a, a big part of their decision-making process. So my feeling is, is that we step back, we continue all the cleanup that we're doing and shoring everything up, and then when we resubmit our application, <coughs> 
doing so as the new entity uh, that has been created from all of that. It's my take. I say we've done a lot. Just make corrections. I say we proceed to reapply. Can I have a motion to reapply? Can I motion to reapply? Well, we're All those in favor say aye. Aye. Okay. okay, the next item up is approved child abuse prevention and reporting policy. Well, you gave us a lot of hard ones no, tonight, no. didn't you? In accordance with California Penal Code 11166, Oxford Preparatory Academy employees are mandated reporters of child abuse. This policy addresses the uh, training procedures for reporting abuse and Oxford's legal responsibility and liability. Can I hear a motion to approve the child abuse prevention and reporting policy? I'll make a motion. Do I have a second? Uh, is it you again? Uh, this got, uh, nobody else. All right. Um, this, is, this is, you know, another thing that's unfortunate to discuss, but um, it's a, uh, a um, you know, at least bi-weekly occurrence where we have to go, go through this. Uh, again, this is more, memorializes what we do. Uh, all of our staff are trained. Um, as we go school year during our RPD and uh, and then to six years of their hire, uh, anybody can come afterwards and train them. What if being a mandated reporter is essentially is anytime uh, any uh, any employee suspects that there's child abuse, uh, child danger called it, they are a mandated reporter. They are the ones who are responsible for calling the child care services uh, to, to report of uh, the issue. Uh, if you look at the bottom of the first page, um, Oxford's Staff must report to the proper authorities if they suspect sexual assault, neglect, willful cruelty, or unjustified punishment, or inhumane corporal punishment or injury or abuse in out of home care. Um, we do our best to, to train the staff on, on, the, on the warning sign, but you know, uh, we have trained professionals to do that, and then we're in the classroom with some of that kind of teachers and teachers' gut. Uh, if, um, you know, if Mr. Shipes feels that they're is a child abuse situation. He comes and he tells uh, his voucher that doesn't relieve him of his duties as a man. He's still the one responsible uh, for doing it, uh, for calling and, and reporting it. Um, I will say, I want to put this on the record that our staff do a great job of this and it's supposed to be confidential who does the reporting. Uh, but unfortunately, we've had a number of instances where parents come back in and say, I know that Mr. Shire is called CPS on the kids. Social worker hope. So I want us to be very clear that, you know, our staff is required to do this, but when they do it, it does take a lot of moral conviction uh, and a lot of stress on them, knowing that they have to call, that most likely a social worker will visit a child's home because of a call that they made. So we don't think that to be lightly, but there are, you know, repercussions that for a relationship. So it's important that we tell our staff that and then train them. So in terms of reporting, um, you see the numbers that we have in there. We'll keep those, those numbers in there for, County, Riverside, San Bernardino County, uh, the numbers to call. Uh, what's been our practice really is that uh, whoever suspects that a child abuse usually contacts the psychologist or the school counselor. They are the experts in it. Uh, they're the ones who present the family report training for the year. So they'll bring them in, hey, this is what I feel. The school psychologist, the counselor says, you know, I can advise you on what I would do, but you're still the person responsible for this. You're still the one who observes it. So it falls back on on the, the staff member. On, on the third page, uh, legal responsibility and liability. Mandated reporters have absolute immunity. School officials, school employees required to report are not civilly or criminally liable for filing a required or authorized report of known or suspected child abuse. If a mandated reporter fails to report an instance of child abuse which she or he knows to exist, or reasonably should know to exist, she or he is guilty of a misdemeanor, punishable by confinement in jail, a fine, or both. The mandated reporter may also be held civilly liable for damages resulting from any injury to the child after a failure to report. So, just to be clear, we have immunity when we report these things. It's always better to over-report than under-report. Um, if it, again, it's proven that, you know, I saw a child that had bruises on his face, on his or her face, and then further injuries occurred, and then something, you know, happens like that, I can be held liable if I can prove it. And uh, then one final thing I want to point out, uh, it's, it's a tough, it's a tough, tough subject. When school employees are accused of, of child abuse, 
regardless of who they are, uh, the major responsibilities of mandated reporters are to identify the incidents and to comply with laws requiring the reporting of suspected abuse to proper authorities. Determining whether or not the suspected abuse actually occurred is not the responsibility of the school. It's not your job to investigate. It's not your job to go down that path. You pass it off, uh, and that's the end of your uh, responsibility. So all of our staff are trained on, on, on that. Uh, so this is our child abuse and prevention policy, memorializing what we, what we are doing. Any questions? OK, all those in favor of the the child abuse Reporting policy say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Okay, approve a new hiring policy to ensure transparency with stakeholders and employees. The Office of Preparatory Academy Board will consider a hiring policy to outline the processes for hiring new staff and the applicable laws uh, that are to be followed. Can I hear a motion to approve a hiring policy? I'll make a motion. Second? Somebody's already been hired. So now it's a matter of evaluating and then having to fire and dismiss. Okay. Is um, that our job too? Well, it's, 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 it's up for debate. And even legal, we went round and round with this with them because it does say ratify in our charters. Right. So where we came out at the other end was saying, okay, we're not going to ratify all employees. It just becomes a big headache. However, we will pre-approve, and districts do this up and down the state, where they pre-approve key employees. And generally, it's like your executive cabinet and your principals. So when you take a look at a district, and uh, like their agenda, um, they will actually take that into closed session. And then they will do their pre-approval, and then they're hired. But something that's different is the districts than charters in the law is that they approve all hires. All hires. I'm just, I'm just concerned because we are not involved in the day to day responsibilities of being managing those employees, and I, I'm worried that that burden lays on us, um, whether to hire or. This, and, and just to make sure, this is clear this is not about termination, this is not about recruitment, this is not about interviewing. Your executive director will recommend, right, and then we will discuss and make a decision. And let me tell you where this came from. This is a policy that out of all of our cleanup, out of all of our recovery plan was not required. But in fact, we had two very serious problems that got this, this organization into trouble. The fiscal, the fact that we didn't have internal controls, uh, the fact that we had a rubber stamping board, right? And the fact that we had really not a higher policy. Okay. And so the executive directors um, actually to whoever they wanted and put them in positions, and, and, and including in the cabinet. And these were people that couldn't even sit, didn't have the capability. Uh, and I think a lot of it had to do with the relationship with the executive director and the fact that they were going for these positions uh, to say no, even when they saw something wrong. So I think that it's important for us to at least look at those top positions, because those were the positions that you had to let them all go, you know, and at least be able to bring them to us 
and, and talk about the qualifications and just talk about it and make sure that the board's comfortable with it. Okay. But those are the only positions. So we're not involved in the interviewing process? No, absolutely not. That they would come to us with a recommendation right. that they would come to any other recommendation? Exactly. For those positions only. Yeah. So no, we're not, the only ones that we recruit, interview, hire is the executive director. That's still the same. Okay. And they wouldn't take any direction from us? Or no. Like no. Okay. I just wanted clarity on that. So uh, can I get a motion to approve the hiring policy? I'll make a motion again. Can I get a second? Awesome. Okay. Now, do we have a presentation? Okay. <laughs> uh, run there really quickly. Uh, <laughs> this is a you know a huge shout out to to Rachel the hockey uh, the HR team uh, and you know the, the side admin who someone's hiring. Uh, just real quickly, a posting procedure. Um, we post all of our positions on EdJoin, uh, but we do post some other places too as needed. But EdJoin is a place where you know we, uh, we find our applicants. Uh, that's number two. Number four, the collection and screening process. Uh, all applications are maintained by the ED or designee prior to the selection of top applicants and thereafter as required by law. The nice thing about that joint is that stores them you know, almost in perpetuity. So the screening happens uh, by the ED or the designee. Um, you know, we'd like to have the ED involved as much as possible or designee, but in terms of what the, the staff needs for a night custodian or you know, uh, a scholar academy aid, you know, Um, item number seven, under selection and offering of position uh, D, the executive director or designee will cause an offer of employment to be made to the recommended applicant contingent upon the submission of required documentation or satisfaction requirements prior to the first day of employment, including having valid current credentials, proof of a background check, and evidence of a, a TE uh, test. So uh, very important that we have those. And first, down to, uh, before, I, before I jump back up, to so number eight, notification if applicants are not selected. Uh, applicants who apply but were not selected to be interviewed will receive written notification they were not selected for interview, and their applications will be on file for the minimum period of time required by law. That's something that Rachel was able to do with EdJoin, just to push it back out to everybody's email address uh, that comes to us. Now moving back up to kind of the, the discussion point between um, Zadley and Starner. Um, the board directors must approve any offer being made to CIO, CAO, CFO, managing director, and chancellor. I think there's a nice um, confluence of, of both of your, your, your points. Um, you know, the board should be involved in daily operations. Um, and you know, this is just asking for approval before an offer is made. So I just want that to be very clear to everybody that it would, just, it would not be in any process. Uh, and that, you know, once we do have stability, I think it might be the point where you could have people positions that you know potentially could be trusted to, to make these decisions, but based on where we've been and the fact that um, basically all those all those positions had to be eradicated, uh, you know, at a spot to be in, you know, hopefully temporarily, where we can get to a point where we, we you know the board has made the right decision and therefore that can flow down. So I uh, appreciate the discussion. Um, can I just ask one more question? Please, yeah. Sorry. I, I know we talked about districts doing this. What do other charters do? Yeah, you know, it, it's all across the board, and um, I, I think where successful charters get to is the board hires the ED, and the ED hires everybody else. You know, I hope that we can get to that point. Uh, but once we get through everything, and once we uh, have a track record of successful hires um, and, and, and clean, clean audits, uh, but that's where I would recommend that we get to eventually is that the ED makes a decision on on everybody um, who reports to to him or Oh yeah, and yeah this is written by and and it depends on, on each organization's comfort level um, some will ratify all uh, uh, someone pick some key employees that they want to have input on like a CFO you know and again it depends on their organization and I think it'll be an experiment okay I guess what makes me nervous is that optically if we're recruiting and therefore there is some involvement by the board and, and that just I well, think, I think optically right now, I think we need this. You know, I, I understand what you're saying. I just, you know, uh, liability on the board, I just want to make sure that we're protected, that, you know, we don't make the wrong decision. Say if you say no, uh, you know, a hiring and somebody comes back and comes 
after us for some legally, right? We made the wrong decision, right? That's because we were not involved in the process and at the coming in at the end and saying yes or no, I don't want to be legally held responsible for that. That's just that's one of my concerns. Yeah. Well, I mean, as long as we make we we are protected from a certain, a certain portion of that. But where I was actually going to take this is that our chart, as approved, as submitted, basically requires, it has the verbiage that says we must ratify. So what this does is it puts a, some, uh, the charter doesn't say exactly which positions we ratify, but it says that we ratify. So we had to document specifically which ones we do, which ones we don't, where the line is drawn, so that we would satisfy the, the conditions of our charter. That's one thing. Just want to make sure we're good moment. Okay, all those in favor of, uh, of approving the hiring policy, say aye. 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 Okay, all those opposed, motion approves. I would imagine we're going to table the Chino calendar. I would think so. Okay. <laughs> I am an optimist, though. <laughs> yeah. Especially okay. me. <laughs> so uh, approval of the updated payroll processing policy and protocol of the Oxford Preparatory Academy Board consistently updates policies to ensure they are current and in compliance with all applicable laws. The payroll policy, a processing policy and protocol comes before the board for review and approval to memorialize how the organization processes payroll and ensure transparency with Oxford Prep's employees and stakeholders. Do I have a motion to approve the updated payroll process policy and protocol? Okay, second? Second. So this is simply memorializing what we already do? Okay. And is this something that Gilbert Associates has requested or is this something that we... This is something that after discussion with Charter Impact as well as legal counsel um, has suggested we move forward in revising we want to make sure we're compliant with state and federal laws, uh, as well as um, fiscal year reporting. Um, as Andy Stern mentioned earlier, uh, our uh, we had a handful of employees that were paid for their 2016-17 um, contracted annual salary. Um, they received that last portion of their salary outside of the schedule. For earnings from the year previous. Uh, so we want to correct that. Uh, in addition to just kind of fine tuning the language included in the payroll processing um, policy, I'm uh, just kind of making things a little bit more fine tuned and more detailed. Uh, so what it includes is a breakdown of you have your non exempt timesheet employees and their time frame for timesheets and submission dates, etc. Um, you have your 12-month non-exempt employees, which when we were, it's originally adopted in April, um, they were moved to a bi-monthly payroll system, uh, or schedule, excuse me. Uh, so essentially their 12-month annual salary would be paid over 24 months, or 24 installments. Um, then you have your exempt 12-month employees, uh, but under federal, Law, they make over a certain threshold in regards to annual salary. Um, so that all will stay consistent. Um, the major change within the payroll processing policy would be to correct the 
change to adhere to the payroll processing policy back in April and make that change immediate. Um, and now we're moving to an 11 month pay schedule for exempt employees uh, that fall in that calendar and then non exempt 22 installments. Um, that will be an adjustment for our employees, um, but we want to get that taken care of and corrected at the beginning of their salary year. Um, so that way they can, they have the information available to them and they can start making those budgetary adjustments um, for the year to start saving for that month of July where they're not going to be getting a paycheck. Um, I've already worked out how the um, figures and deductions would be adjusted in regards to um, if they have any medical deductions, uh, any other authorized deductions um, from their paychecks, as well as I've spoken with Charter Impacts and um, they can get us set up and have a presentation set for our employees on uh, how they can get set up with the, I believe it's California Credit Union, um, a summer saver program. I know schools first offers one as well. Um, I take part in it and I'm a 12 month employee. So it's a great way to save. Um, so we can offer that to our employees as well. Um, but just after much discussion with Charter Impact and their guidance, um, their payroll team and their um, director of operations have been awesome with all of this, as well as our legal counsel. Um, this would just be the best move going forward for the new contractual year, as well as fiscal year for our teachers and staff at that effect. And is this the first that our employees are hearing about this? First. So we don't, we haven't heard any reaction? Um, not yet. Okay. Um, we were paying them, 11 month employees were paying them 12, I mean, we were basically dividing it at 12. Mm -hmm. They would start their calendar year in August. Their first paycheck would be end of August, early September. And then their last check would be end of July, beginning of August. But that takes us out of the fiscal reporting year for retirement. Um, and so then you're having to correct that each year. Um, and so it makes oh yeah, more this, sense. This follows what I've mm -hmm. seen in districts, at least. Uh, my wife's an 11 month employee. So exactly. Have to plan for that. So exactly. So that's why um, getting it taken care of right at the beginning of the year is very important. Um, this information will be reviewed with, if approved, will be reviewed with our employees in significant detail during staff development uh, and trying to provide them the resources necessary so they can plan accordingly. You know, um, something that we talked about our, in our board session in February, uh, the board seemed to be surprised that uh, exempt employees uh, don't uh, fill out any kind of time card at all. Is that is that still the case? Correct. Okay. So if we wanted to make that a part of our procedure, uh, would this be the document that we would amend, or is there, I don't know, Mr. Crow, would you know the answer Probably. again? Probably would be. Mm -hmm. Do exempt employees have to fill out? Exempt employees don't. Many, many um, places do. Many, some do that aren't that administrative exempt, um, but non-exempt, like yeah. you're better on salary schedule, um, yes. I think Ambassador, we're going to go probably take a little bit of research on how to best implement yeah. our practices, so is that something? Right, so we so wouldn't want to do this tonight if this is something we want to take a look at because we want to get this approved. Correct. Uh, but, uh, but it may be something that we may want to revisit. And again, sometimes it has legal implications where somebody says, no, I was at work on that day, and, uh, and they, we don't have a written document that they signed to show that they were working on there's different kinds of implications as to why you do something like that. Uh, but uh, again, I think it was brought up at the February meeting. I think it's something we'd like to take a look at, but we certainly don't want to stall this to do. But this would be the document that yes, we would come yes. back to, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. to amend if we wanted to. Yes. Okay. Okay, so, and do we have any other questions? Okay, so we have a first and a second. Uh, all those in favor of approving the updated payroll Processing policy and protocol, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? The motion carries. Okay, thank you so much, Rachel. 
Okay, delegate decision-making authority to Oxford Prep Executive Director, uh, or their designate, uh, related to early admission to transitional kindergarten. Um, under Ed Code, uh, a child who will have his or her fifth birthday after December 2nd, but not during that same school year, may be admitted to Oxford Prep's TK program if the Board of Directors determines that the admittance is in the best interest of the child. Currently, each individual case is presented to the board. The proposal uh, is to delegate the authority uh, so that it would align with common practices among large school districts in California and improve the efficiency of TK enrollment procedures. And so we're looking for a motion to approve delegation of this authority to the Oxford Prep Executive Director related to early admission to transitional kindergartens. Do I have a motion? I'd like to discuss. Would you like to discuss her? Okay. So, is this going to still, are you going to still do what was recently done, and that is the evaluation, look uh, and have the, the counselors, the professionals, the designees um, evaluate the child on a case by case basis? Yeah, if, it, uh, if the board, if, whatever way the board decides to go, uh, the protocol that we have written up and we'll you know, have our internal protocol on board uh, is to have the child be interviewed by uh, school psychologists for social emotional readiness uh, and by a kindergarten teacher uh, or a lower grade teacher or the, or the dean who will receive the lower grades for academic and social emotional readiness and that um, recommendation would then be given to the ED or designee so that would be possible what that is the policy and that would be a policy moving forward yes because uh, I, I like the report that we saw um, and the detail and so on and so forth and you're going to have that to the other thing that I think we need to be aware of is, is the ADA on that student, am I correct? Correct. So uh, they would enter a school, but we would not receive ADA until they turned... Until they turned that five years old. Right. Yeah. So, so this could be uh, actually a fiscal concern if you had a number of these, right? If you had a number of these and if you had a number of them whose birthday were in May and yeah. June. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So there's, there's, there's also budget implications. So it's something that we might put into play. Okay. So now do I have uh, an motion to uh, approve uh, the delegation of authority to Oxford Prep Executive Director related to early admission to transitional kindergarten? I'll make the motion. That's the same motion. Gotcha. No. Okay. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Okay. Motion carries. Uh, approve student cell phone and personal electronic device policy. I bet the teachers are going to love this one. The board will consider the call uh, cell phone policy outlining the rules for student possession and personal electronic devices on Oxford Prep campuses during school hours. So we currently have no policy? Uh, we do have um, a, a guideline, but okay, we do not have a more okay. life policy. So can I hear a motion to approve the student cell phone and personal electronic device policy? So moved. Second? Awesome. Okay. okay. It's going to be real quick. Okay. Uh, um, this That's is how for, we like it. For cell phones and, and iPads, other computers that bring on the campus, not related to the Oxford Prep issue problem. Those are that. Um, students may not use personal cell phones and devices during the school day. During the school day, personal cell phones and devices must be turned off and will be kept in the storage area provided by Oxford Prep. Students bring the devices in, turn them off, put them in the bin in the child's classroom. Um, <clears throat> use of personal cell phones and devices before or after school must follow these guidelines. You can disrupt educational activities. Uh, you can't harass or bully others using them. You may not uh, transmit any obscene, threatening, or otherwise inappropriate items. Uh, and then um, students shall not attempt to circumvent or impair Oxford Prep network security using personal cell phones and devices. Yeah. Students shall not. <laughs> students shall not attempt to obtain unauthorized access to, nor make inappropriate use of the Oxford Prep network using personal cell phones and devices. And the final one, uh, if there are parents here, parents listening, I'm going to say this really clearly, unauthorized possession or use by a student of a cell phone or personal electronic device will lead to temporary confiscation of the device. Repeated unauthorized possession or use of personal cell phones or devices may lead to disciplinary action consistent with the charter and the parent informational handbook. So I've got a question. I might I'm speaking just from experience being on the parent side is my, my kids have those little you know, gadgets. And they have to turn them off when the class starts and so on and so forth. At this point, based on this policy, they're taking it off and throwing it in the bin. But this, how this policy is correct. 
Yes, it should be as that's how it reads. GPS tracking for lost child. Oh, I, I see. You're not talking about a like a, an eye watch. You know, no, well, it has watch. it has a phone capability to limited numbers, and right now it's just okay. yeah, like the frog things. Those, yeah. yeah, those from our understanding with the those are exempt from it. Oh, okay. But an Apple Watch would have to go yeah, with it. Yeah, because it's full blown phone. Yes, correct. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. All those in favor of approving the student cell phone personal electronic device policy say aye. 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 Uh, anyone opposed? Okay, motion carried. We are going to be adjourning in the closed session at uh, 9 11. Okay, we're back in open session at 9 52. We have nothing to, to report out of closed session. Uh, may I have a motion to adjourn? Make a motion. Second? Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Motion carries. Good night, everyone. Thank Good night. you. Thank you. Thank you.